Siamo davanti al momento topico direi di, di, di questo festival dedicato alla Sharing Economy qui a Milano che vuole essere eh, un po' al centro del mondo e proprio per questo ha chiamato direttamente da New York dalla Stan School New York University Sundan Rarajan che è eh, praticamente il massimo esperto mondiale di Sharing Economy e sta studiando questi fenomeni da qualche anno, ne parla abitualmente con la Casa Bianca piuttosto che con la Federal Trade Commission e specialmente per voi quindi do il benvenuto a Aron. Prego. Thank you. Naturalmente Thank you. ha scritto anche un bellissimo libro che potrete trovare eh, dove c'è eh, l'area riservata stampa con la sua dedica se le sue parole vi avranno convinto per diventare i prosumer del 2016. Buon ascolto. Thank you Luisa. It's, uh... So while we wait for uh, my slides to come up, um, I'm going to take another picture of all of you. So i normally don't take pictures of my audience, but this is such a beautiful place, and you're all so good-looking, so I feel like I should. Also, one day when I have grandkids and they don't listen to me, I'll show them this picture and I'll say, see, people used to come to listen to me talk. Um, Sorry, Aaron, uh, we okay. apologize. Uh, <laughs> vi devo intrattenere un attimo, c'è stato un disguido tecnico. Eh, volevamo supportare la presentazione di, di Aaron, che ovviamente parla in inglese, con delle slide sotto che passano in italiano. Quindi, se avete un attimo di pazienza, e uh, I, I do apologize with you for this inconvenience. No, no, that's fine. Um, this is, uh, quindi, l'attenzione per questa... Uh, presentazione che ci illuminerà di Arun uh, durerà ancora un po' di più e sarà ancora più, tutto più bello. Grazie. Regulation of business. <clears throat> And it's natural to expect that there will be a conflict between the businesses that are new and the existing regulations because the Services that typically are part of the sharing economy, um, finding accommodation, getting transportation, lending money, getting a meal, all of these are not new services. They are existing services. They have existed for a long time. And because of that, there is a existing set of regulations mm -hmm. for the old way. And the new way of doing, finding accommodation, getting transportation, doesn't fit well into the old boxes. Sorry, I stopped just to, to, just to, to clear. Um, quindi Arun fa una riflessione sul fatto che in realtà stiamo, siamo di fronte a un grosso cambiamento e gli stessi servizi che già conoscevamo possono essere veicolati attraverso il digitale anche con la sharing economy in maniera diversa. Il problema è che le regole che noi conosciamo sono quelle basate sul business tradizionale. È e gli faccio la prossima domanda. And, and so I'll, I'll, I'll just, so initially it's, you should expect that on the business regulation front you have trouble, but what really needs to happen is that, you know, a forward-looking government or a, a government who is thinking clearly about the sharing economy has to realize that the regulations need to change and that the party that does the regulation also has to shift a little. That we have to stop thinking about the government as the only entity that is creating rules and enforcing them. Can I them. just stop on this? Yeah. Uh, uh, because I think this is an important concept. Yeah. Uh, Arun pensa che il, i, i governi che vogliono pensare di tradurre questo cambiamento in un'opportunità per il paese in questo caso per l'Italia, eh, debbano eh, eh, appunto ragionare su nuovi nuove leggi, nuovi regolamenti che eh, funzionino come traino a questo fenomeno che ha, sta già, eh, eh, esiste già, e esiste anche perché siete qua tutti a ascoltare questa cosa della sharing economy e penso che sia la prima volta che c'è una platea così grande in Italia sul tema della sharing economy. Eh, di Arun dice un'altra cosa, non dobbiamo aspettarci 
eh, il, leggi e regolamenti solo dalla, eh, dal governo. Eh, leggi e regolamenti possono arrivare in altre forme. So, in which other forms uh, regulation... Okay. Oh, that's great. Ah, ok. <laughs> ok. I disappear. Oh, okay. It, it, Maybe you is, can. Is it okay? I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to keep him here so that he can keep translating what I'm saying. Wow. No, <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Do you I, prefer? I'm, no, but no, 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 I, I'm, I will be there, and if I need, if you need. Okay. It, yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. The floor okay, is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> okay, so I'll continue where I left off. We, you know, the, the pattern that I saw was that there was something similar across lots of different companies that were inventing new ways of providing familiar things. And I began to conjecture that, um, you know, this is, we are, we, we are not just creating a few new companies, but we are inventing a new way a fundamentally new way of organizing economic activity. And so while my book is called The Sharing Economy, um, the subtitle refers to crowd-based capitalism, which I think is the best label for these different businesses. Um, the sharing economy, I think, um, is more understandable to a larger group of people, so my publisher decided that that would be the title of the book and not my sort of my academic term, crowd-based capitalism. But just to give you a sense for what I mean by crowd-based capitalism, let me give you some examples. Um, these examples are across a range of industries, and they'll start to illustrate to you what I find so interesting about this transition in economic activity. So when I was a kid, I would watch television. You know, how many of you watched television as a kid? Okay, how many of you would get your friends and watch television with your friends? Okay, so, and this, this was my form of, one form of entertainment. The content that I watched, the television programs that I watched, were typically created by a large corporation, by a TV studio, by a movie studio, and then they were delivered to me by a different large company, the television network, which is either owned like a large private company or owned by the government. Um, today's kids watch YouTube. Um, they don't watch YouTube like I do, where you go and watch one video. They watch YouTube the way that I would watch television. This is their primary form of entertainment. I see this a lot. And if you think about what's changed, YouTube is owned by Google, so it's still a large company that is aggregating demand and sort of like aggregating content, but the content is not created by large companies anymore. It is created by individuals who post their videos, it's created by small businesses that post their videos, and it's created by large studios. And so we've moved away from a world where the content that we watch for entertainment was created by a large company to a world where a distributed crowd of creators are creating the content that we watch for video entertainment. So if you want to get money to support your favorite cause, it used to be that you would go to a philanthropic foundation. Today, if you want to raise money to make a movie, to make your uh, music video, to fund a local theater in your neighborhood, um, to like you know some any cause that you want, there is a wide array of crowd-based philanthropic organizations that you can go to. Okay, so let's take Kickstarter as an example. Um, there there are many in sort of countries around the world, but when you list your project on Kickstarter, you're not asking Kickstarter, the company, for money the way that you would ask a foundation for money. You're just using it as a way to list and then a distributed crowd of people will give money to the causes that they support, will fund your book, will fund your movie, will fund the construction of the theater, will fund your new product. So again, in philanthropy, we're moving away from institutions to crowds. 
Similarly, um, it used to be that if you wanted to raise money to start your new business, you would go to a venture capitalist. The venture capitalist would you know, raise capital, would decide what investments are good, and would sort of give the investments to the companies that they thought were going to be successful. Today, venture capital still exists, of course, but there is a crowd-based form of venture capital where you list your company, you provide whatever information you would provide a traditional venture capitalist, but there is a crowd of individuals that connect to platforms like AngelList and CircleUp who are investing their own money in exchange for equity. And so we are creating a distributed crowd of venture capitalists, each of whom is sort of managing their own little portfolio, and the investments can be as little as $1,000 or $5,000. It's the same thing with small business lending. It used to be that you would go to a bank if you need a loan as a small business. Today, there's a wide variety of crowd-based alternatives for small business lending. I'll walk you through the example of Funding Circle that is based in the UK. So a typical business that goes to Funding Circle wants to raise about 50,000 um, pounds. It's typically a business that's been around for a few years, and it provides all of the documentation that you would normally give a bank if you were applying for a bank loan. Now, this gets posted on Funding Circle, but Funding Circle doesn't have money to lend. There is a crowd of investors who are also connected to Funding Circle, and the typical loan of 50,000 pounds is funded by over 200 investors, each of whom is lending as little as 20 pounds. And so we're moving, we're moving from a bank-based institutional model to a crowd-based model of small business lending, where the lenders are a distributed group of individuals in a crowd. So we've all rented cars. How many of you have rented a car? Good. So, you know, if you think about it, the car rental model involves having a dedicated fleet of cars that are available for rental. Today, in a number of countries around the world, there's a crowd-based alternative. For example, Get Around in the United States allows people who own cars to rent them out to other people when they're not using them. And so if you own a car, you can become a tiny car rental business through Get Around. Similar platforms exist in various countries around the world. Um, Drivey, for example, operates in a number of European countries with the same model. You own cars, you start renting them to other people. So we move from institutional, large fleet car rental to peer-to-peer crowd-based car rental, where the platform is providing some of the same things that the rental car company used to. It provides insurance, it provides quality guarantees, it tells you about availability, it helps with pricing. But the actual business of car renting is being done by a distributed group of individuals. You know, when we want food, we go to the grocery store to buy food. There is a growing number of crowd-based alternatives where instead of buying from a large institution, a grocery chain, you buy from the people who create the food themselves. You buy from the farmers who grow the fruits and vegetables. You die from the person who sort of does the fishing, the meat producer. And for example, La Rouge Qui de Vie, which is a platform out of Paris, has created this crowd-based alternative to grocery shopping. It's like the farmer's market, but it's through a platform where you can say, this is what I want, and then you go and pick it up at some point. Today, we get our energy from an energy company, from a large power company. It's either owned by the government or a large corporation. Today, there is very little that is happening in the crowd-based energy space. Um, although I did see a very interesting company out there in the stalls, you should go and check them out, how, like, you know, sort of talking about energy prosumers. The, the thing is that in a few years, we will have battery technology that is good enough for us to store solar power that we generate on our own. And at that point, I expect that neighborhoods will be able to create platforms that allow individuals who are producing power, energy, electricity, 
to supply this electricity to other people in their neighborhoods. The energy will be transmitted either in conventional ways or will be transmitted by um, you know, transporting the battery physically from one place to another. Okay, so all of the examples that I've shown you so far have not mentioned any of the companies that we normally associate with the sharing economy, right? The big sort of names that are always in the news of Uber and Airbnb and blah, blah, car. Um, so let's get to one such example. Um, <clears throat> in the past, if you wanted to create short-term accommodation as a business, you would build a hotel or you would run a bed and breakfast. You would dedicate those resources to the provision of short-term accommodation. Today, there's a wide variety of platforms that are connecting people who have space with people who need the space as a business. And so again, we're moving from an institution-based model of providing short-term accommodation to a crowd-based model where the platform aggregates the demand, provides some sort of quality assurance, provides some sort of shared services. It's almost like a franchise. But the actual business of providing short-term accommodation is through a distributed crowd of individuals. So the world's largest hotel chain today was formed by the merger of Marriott and Starwood. Marriott and Starwood merged have 1.1 million rooms. The Airbnb platform has over 3 million listings. By any measure, by the early next year, they will have more instant book listings than Marriott and Starwood have rooms, just that one line of business. So by any measure, they will be the world's largest provider of short-term accommodation. You know, I bring up this not as a pat on the back to Airbnb, although, of course, like, you know, it's, it's a business that um, you know, has seen remarkable growth, but because I want to highlight the fact that companies like this that are practicing crowd-based capitalism are soon going to be the largest companies in their space. Across a wide range of industries, we are creating a new way of organizing economic activity. We are replacing the managerial capitalism of the 20th century, where a company would accumulate resources, build factories, hire people full-time, and deliver branded goods and services to a crowd-based model where companies are instead creating platforms that aggregate the demand, that bring the consumers, but the actual supply, the actual resources, the actual pricing in many cases, the actual businesses for the services and goods are not provided directly by the company, but are provided by a distributed group of individuals, the crowd. That's why I call this crowd-based capitalism. The crowd-based is where the supply comes from, and the capitalism is to underscore the fact that this is a new capitalist way of organizing economic activity that I think will be comparable to traditional managerial capitalism you know, in the next couple of decades. Now, there are a couple of interesting features of the sharing economy that I wanted to highlight as part of the talk, and then I'll tell you a bit about what the future of work looks like and what we should do about regulation, the discussion that we started. But one of the more interesting dimensions of the sharing economy that I have found very compelling is that it blurs lines between personal and professional. What do I mean by this? So how many of you own a car? Okay. How many of you have given someone a ride to the airport or to the train station? You own a car, someone's going to come and want a ride from the airport, right? So how many of you have had a guest stay in your home? Okay. How many of you have prepared a meal for someone else in your kitchen and had them eat that meal? Right. I'm not going to ask how many of you have lent money to a friend. That's often a question where you know, it sort of makes people angry. Like, you know, like, you know, I, I, I asked that once, and then four people sort of walked out, and then they were on their phones. They were you know, sort of in collection mode all of a sudden. But you know, these kinds of things used to be under the personal umbrella. We all did them. You know, you didn't have to go to the government and say, give me a permit so that I can pick my friend up from the airport. 
you know, we, if you have kids, chances are that you have taken your friend's kids somewhere. You didn't need a special permit from the government for that. Nobody from the government came to inspect your kitchen before you had your dinner party. Right? I mean, nobody from the government came to inspect your apartment before you had someone stay over. These were all under the personal umbrella. And on the professional side, we had taxi drivers, we had bed and breakfast, we had restaurants, you had banks. So what the sharing economy is doing is it's blurring these lines. Someone who hosts on Airbnb is sharing space in their apartment, doing it occasionally, but they're starting to do it for money. It's becoming commercial. Someone who drives for Lyft in the United States, typically the typical Lyft driver, Lyft is a platform for ride sharing, the typical Lyft driver drives about 12 to 15 hours a week. And so two to three hours a day on weekdays or one to two hours a day, including weekends. So it's not you know, they, a lot of them think of it as just an extension of what they used to do. Now, the reason why I bring this up is because more and more of business is going to blur these lines between personal and professional. And when that happens, the regulatory systems that we've set up start to fail because they've been set up expecting big companies with professional providers on the other side. So on the regulation front, and I'll come back to this, my message is not that we should throw out the regulation. It's that we have to think about regulation differently because the people we are regulating, the services, the service providers, the business models are fundamentally different. And so we can't fit this old sort of taxi medallion or hotel regulation or financial regulation or restaurant regulation model to the new world. You have to create a new world of regulation. And so this blurring of lines between personal and professional is most salient to me in the provision of transportation long distance. And the company that dominates that space in Europe is Blablacar. You've probably heard from them earlier today. Um, Google has a service that they just launched through the Waze platform. Waze is a service that provides routes mapping. Um, you can now carpool through Waze, so when you're commuting, you can share your ride with someone else um, for money through the Waze platform. But Blablacar is interesting because it operates in 22 countries. It is a service, for those of you who don't know, who allow you, that allows you to sh sell empty seats in your car when you are driving from one city to another. So for example, this morning, the price on the Milano to Rome drive was 32 euros. And you go and look into it, and there'll be hundreds of different options. Some people are you know, driving a Mercedes, like you know, comfortable, lots of legroom. I play soft jazz. Someone else is driving a Toyota Prius. I'm environmentally friendly, but there's not much legroom. They even have a rating for how talkative I am. I am a quiet person, blah. I talk a lot, blah, blah, blah. And so what, what's fascinating about this to me is the scale of blah, blah, car. So these blue dots are representing people traveling in empty seats in other people's cars across a 12-hour period in Europe. So if you count the number of people in blah, blah, car seats in France today, it's five times the number of people in Eurostar. You add up all the people who are traveling on blah, blah, car in any day, and it's way more than the number of people who travel on the American national rail system, Amtrak. And so Blablacar, the platform, has created the capacity of a national rail network by tapping into spare space in people's cars and converting the individual who is driving from one city to another to be a supplier in the crowd of point-to-point -point transportation from one city to another. Now, they haven't just created you know, the ability to tap into other people's cars. They've also created an infrastructure of trust. Because when I first heard about Blablaka, I said, this is crazy. You know, I mean, you're actually telling me that I have to get into a stranger's car. And it's not just going down the street. I have to sit with them for six hours. And you know, they, this, this sounds like a recipe for disaster, right? Where 
you know, especially in the United States where there is, you know, in the cultural dialogue, this sort of fear of hitchhiking, that hitchhiking is a dangerous thing to do. And so I've been collaborating with BlaBlaCar for about a year now on research. Their CEO and I share a, an interest in trust. And part of what makes me interested in this is that I believe that we are creating a new infrastructure for peer-to-peer -peer trust that is going to dramatically change how we organize economic activity. And I look at history, and I say that a long time ago, when we lived in villages, the only people who we would engage in commerce with were the people in our community. We trusted them. So you'd buy milk from the person who had the cow in the village. You didn't want to buy milk from the neighboring village because you didn't know if it was real milk or if it was you know, something that just sort of some powder mixed with water. And then the government came along and started to create some trust. They set food standards. They set standards on weights and measures. There were laws against adulteration. And then, like, different countries created courts. They created contracting. They created property rights. Each of these was an innovation in expanding trust that allowed us to transact with people who we didn't know at greater scale. And every time we had this kind of new trust infrastructure, the economy expanded. And so we are on the verge of creating a digital trust infrastructure. And this is really, if you ask me, what is the one thing that is central to the sharing economy, more than anything else that has enabled crowd-based capitalism today? Yes, it's the fact that we have GPS-enabled mobile phones, but it's the existence of this trust infrastructure that really makes it possible. And so in the study with BlaBlaCar, one of the interesting things that has come out of our survey so far is that you know, we asked people in 11 different countries, 20,000 people, about the levels of trust they have in friends, in family, in colleagues, in neighbors, in LinkedIn contacts, Facebook contacts, Twitter contacts, you know, someone who you meet on the street and you don't know, and in someone who you don't know but has a full trust profile, digital trust profile. And this, you know, I'm highlighting this finding because it was the one that really surprised me. That people who are using blah blah car trust someone who they don't know, but who has a full trust digital profile at the level that they trust friends and family. They trust them more than they trust their neighbors and colleagues and they trust them way more than they trust social media contacts. So this is not people being digitally blind or saying that, you know, I trust everybody on Facebook. Facebook is down at 16%. But 88, nine out of, eight out of nine people trust someone with a blah blah car profile, sort of at a very high level, comparable to friends and family. So me, this either means that blah blah car users have sort of a completely different set of colleagues and neighbors that they don't get along with, or it means that we have started to create a digital infrastructure that is raising the levels of trust in society. So this is certainly something to watch. All right, so pretty pictures that make that point. All right, if someone can hear me, can, okay, there we go. All right, so <clears throat> it didn't take me very long to understand why people traveled in blah blah car. Once I understood trust, I understood that you know there was a cost advantage to traveling in blah blah car. You know, the there was a convenience advantage. Sometimes the driver would come and pick you up from your home. There was a schedule advantage, you know, the train only ran four times a day, but there are blah blah cars leaving all the time. And maybe for some cases there's a comfort advantage, like, you know, there's a nice comfortable car seat instead of like, you know, sitting in a small seat in the train. But I never really understood why do people drive for blah blah car? What is it that makes someone who has like a 40,000 euro car to open their doors to other people and they don't really get that much money? They make some money. You know, 32 euros for Milan to Paris is actually, from Milan to Rome is actually high. You know, sort of Paris to Lyon, it's normally 10, 15 euros. And so even if you fill your car, you're going to make 50, 60, 70 euros. 
I mean, is it really worth the money to have like three strangers sitting in your car? What is it that's motivating these people to drive for blah blah car? So I kept asking the founders, like, you know, give me the reason why people drive for blah blah car, and they'd keep sending me statistics. They'd say we launched in Poland. They'd say we launched in Russia. They wouldn't answer this question. And I thought maybe it's a difficult question to answer. Maybe like you know, maybe people don't like driving for blah blah car. I don't know. But after asking them multiple times, finally one of their founders and their founders are these young French guys sent me this picture. And he said, "Look at this picture, and this picture will answer the question: Why do people drive for blah blah car?" And this was the picture that he sent me. So I looked at the picture and I said, "Okay, I get it," but it also made me think, because the way that technology is typically described today is that digital technology takes us far apart. That instead of hanging out with our friends, we are Facebooking them. Instead of seeking real community, we are on Snapchat. That. Technology is taking us further and further away from each other, and Sherry Turkle, who is an MIT professor, has written about this in three wonderful books over 15 years. The thing is that that's not a new narrative; it's not a new message about digital technology. It's something that people have been writing about for decades about technology in general. So Nisbet, who is a American sociologist in the 50s, was lamenting how economic development and technological progress takes us further away from each other and destroys community. He has a quote in his book about how, like you know, the social contexts are being destroyed, but it's not an original quote. He is quoting Durkheim from, like you know, the 19th century, who was also writing about how technological progress. Destroys communities and social context. So one of the things that makes me most excited about the sharing economy is that we seem to finally have used technology to create something that brings people closer together. Because the blah blah car drivers, the Airbnb hosts and guests, the Lyft passengers, the eatwith people who are sort of going to supper clubs. The users who are shopping for their groceries through La Roche Qui Vive, um, they come to the service often because the price is better, or the convenience is better, or the variety is better. But what keeps them there is that, as part of doing something that you need to do anyway, you are also injecting some real human connection. This is not like a dating site where you're saying, "Come here to meet people." I mean, who has time to go and use technology to meet people, right? This is saying, "Do you need a ride? I need a place to stay. I need to get my groceries. I need a meal." Our everyday economic activities are starting to be more connected, involving connection with other human beings, and I think over time this will make us a more connected society, and this will. You know, in my mind, be the true gift of the sharing economy in the long run. All right. So,、uh, how should we do this?、Um, we have a little bit of time.、Um, I'm going to quickly run through a couple more things, and then, you know, can can I take questions?、Um, we can take questions, right?、Uh, am I am I going to be taking questions or? Yes. Okay. All right. So I'll spend five more minutes, and then, you know,、um, we can spend the rest of the time on questions. So I'll skip over economic impacts and go straight to the next two topics. Although the message on economic impacts, chapter five of my book, it lays out exactly how、um, this move to crowd-based capitalism is going to be good for the economy.、Um, the thing that concerns more pe- most people is what will crowd-based capitalism. And the sharing economy do to the future of work, because a lot of times people see these platforms that are connecting you with freelancers of different kinds to do your odd jobs at home, or for home services,、um, or for personal services like ship, which will sh- someone will come home and mail your packages for you. Postmates, someone will pick up something for you and bring it to you. Lux, someone will park your car. Shuttle. Someone picks up your kids from school.、Um, rinse. Someone comes 
picks up your laundry, does it, and brings it back. Manchuri, someone cooks a meal and brings it to you. Zeal, someone sends you a massage therapist. Um, you know, there's a wide variety of places that will send you alcohol. There's even one called Ease, which will send you medical marijuana on demand. And so there are all these services. I don't know anything about that. I've, I've uh, heard that this is not a new service, but uh, that's what my other professors at NYU tell me. But um, that's just secondhand information. So a lot of the focus has been on, oh, OK, if we're creating all these services that are you know, people doing stuff for other people, is this really the future of work promised by the sharing economy? What they're ignoring is that there is a parallel set of platforms that is changing in a crowd-based way how professional services of different kinds are organized. For example, Universal Avenue is a sales force on demand. If you are a good salesperson, you can run your own selling business through Universal Avenue. You don't have to work as an employee for a company. You just say, I can sell. They have clients. And you get like, you know, sort of a much higher fraction of the revenue that is generated from those sales than you would as a typical salesperson. UpCounsel is a platform for lawyers. If you want corporate clients, that's fine. They have them except you list yourself as your business of one instead of working full-time for a legal firm, and you get to keep a much larger fraction of the revenue that is generated from these clients. Hourly Nerd does the same thing for MBA consultants. Co-Contest, which is a local company, does the same thing for architects. And so we are creating a whole bunch of platforms that are taking what used to be full-time jobs in companies and converting them into things where you, based on your capabilities, can run your own business, providing whatever services you want to provide. Now, what this does is that it's going to start to change the nature of the relationship that you have with your institution. We are used to living in a world where we work for someone else. We work full time. But an Airbnb host doesn't work for Airbnb. Airbnb is their platform. Um, a lender on Funding Circle does not work for Funding Circle. Funding Circle is their platform through which they run their small business. A driver on Blah Blah Car does not work for Blah Blah Car. Blah Blah Car is a platform through which they are running their small business. And so what's going to happen over the next 20 years is that we are going to change the nature of the relationship that the individual has with the institution. We are used to a world where the individual was a wage receiver. You provided your labor, your talent, and you got a salary. We're moving to a world where the individual becomes part owner, becomes someone who is running a tiny business through a platform that is aggregating demand and providing brand for them. You think of what an Etsy seller does. They have to set price. They have to manage inventory. They have to man manage manufacturing. Think about an Airbnb host. They also have to set price. They have to do merchandising. They have to manage their brand through the reputation system. So the future of work is going to increasingly involve people working for themselves rather than people working for someone else. And this is going to be a pretty dramatic shift in the workforce. And it's one that I fear that we're not preparing our kids for. We're not educating them with the right skills that will allow them to thrive in a world where you're not getting a job, career trajectory. Instead, you have to design your own work. And you have to create your own opportunities. You have to run your own tiny business. So what does this do? What this also does is that it starts to challenge the contract that we have created with society. So think about full-time employment today. It gives you income stability. You get the same amount of money every month. It gives you benefits of different kinds. You may get health insurance. You get protection against accidents in the workplace. You, get, um, you, know, uh, you may get paid vacation. Of course, you get paid vacation. Um, the company may provide some money towards your retirement. Like in some companies, you even get a pension when you retire. So all of this is part of the social contract that we have constructed around full-time employment, having a job full-time. But this is important to understand. And you know, if there's one point that you take away from today's talk, 
it's this one. None of this is fundamental to full-time employment. Full-time employment 100 years ago had none of this. Full-time employment, there were no child labor laws, there was no minimum wage, there was no overtime. If you read the stories of the people working in the meatpacking factories in the 1920s, that's what full-time employment was. We have constructed through the syndicates, through the unions, through government intervention, through collectives, a particular social contract and a funding model for all of these things that we want, for the vacations, for the stability, for the protections. Now we have a new model of work, the independent worker through the platform. We have to construct a similar contract and a similar funding model. So my belief is that the world of independent workers is fundamentally better for the individual. Today it doesn't look that good because we're comparing it to full-time employment. But we're comparing it to full-time employment after 100 years of progress. And so we need to detach some of those things that are only associated with full-time employment and come up with ways to fund them around the independent work model. This is the biggest public policy challenge that countries like the United States and the United Kingdom face in the next 20 years. Some of that will come from benefits that are portable. Some countries are experimenting with a universal basic income where everybody gets paid a certain amount every month from the government, independent of whether they're working or not. But in parallel, we are also facing rapid automation I don't think it's as rapid as most people think it is. You know, you must, how many of you have heard about self-driving cars? About the jobs are being taken by the computers? You know, this, this is something that you hear about a lot today. Um, and the thing is that if you look at history, human labor has been automated through history. You know, the start of the 20th century, 30% of people in the United States worked in agriculture, in farming. Today, that number is less than 1%. Everything else is done by machines. Over the last 30 years, manufacturing has been automated at a really rapid pace, where there's, I think, a hundredth of the manufacturing, you know, US manufacturing is at an all-time high, but US manufacturing employment is at an all-time low. So we are noticing automation now because it's touching our worlds, you know, but it's been happening for a long time. We just don't have dinner parties with factory workers and people who have been facing this kind of automation. But now journalism is being automated, medicine is being automated, being a law clerk is being automated, and so that's happening. Because that's happening, it's going to be increasingly important for us to create the successors to the unions, to create collectives that involve these sharing economy providers. All right, um, <clears throat> actually one final point on that and then maybe I'll stop um, and uh, actually I'll, I'll, and then maybe we can get to the regulation stuff and the questions. Um, <clears throat> you know, in a world where you work for someone else, your career path is well defined. You have a clear, you know, I join this, I join as an associate and then I get promoted to junior manager and then you know, you want to become CEO, you have a clear sort of trajectory for how you should manage your life. <clears throat> um, when we get become an economy where more and more people are working for themselves, we're going to need some way of helping people manage their careers. So I tell my university, I work for New York University, that this is the big opportunity for the university in the future of not just giving people career counseling right before they graduate, but of having a lifetime relationship with them because they're really going to need it. Um, we're also going to have to replace the community structure that the company represents. You know, we used to have the church, we used to have, I mean, a lot of people still have church, but um, the Rotary Club, the village community, a lot of these community structures have been replaced by the company that you work for. That is often your social circle or part of your day-to-day -day interaction with people. Once that goes away, we're going to have to come up with new community structures as well. So is another thing where I think the university has a big role to play. All right, so <clears throat> I'll end with this slide. Um, I'll actually end with this slide. 
um, and say a few things that have to do with some of the other slides as well. <clears throat> as I sort of mentioned in my discussion, like, you know, before the talk started, um, these new business models don't fit into the old regulatory boxes. What this means is that you have to come up with a new regulatory system. Um, my belief is that it is impossible to create a regulatory system that is entirely run by the government. It has to be a partnership between the government and the private sector. Many sharing economy platforms are just inventing the regulation themselves because they do not have a regulatory structure to plug into. They are running their businesses. They are right when they say that their business doesn't fit the old regulation. But the solution isn't, try, isn't to try and stuff them into these old regulatory boxes. It is to create a new framework that includes them. If you think about a world where you have to regulate a 1,000 hotels, maybe a government can do that. If you have to regulate 10 million Airbnb hosts, it's very clear that you want to get some help from the platform. So my prescription for regulating the sharing economy is that it will actually increase the level of regulation, but it should reduce the level of regulation that is done by the government and shift a lot of that responsibility to other stakeholders in society, like the platforms, okay, both in the setting of the rules and the enforcement. If you want to collect tax from Airbnb hosts, don't set up a system to register them. Instead, have Airbnb collect the tax and give it to you. Subject them to an audit. If you want to see if there are discriminatory patterns on a particular taxi platform, don't ask for data. Delegate the responsibility to the party that holds the data. This is far more. Once you ask for data, you get into privacy debates, and that distracts from the core problem of regulating. The solution often is to delegate the regulatory responsibility to the party that holds the data instead of saying, open your data to me. Subject them to an audit, ask them for an API so that you can check whether they are complying. But that's, um, I'll stop there. Um, let's click to the last slide. Okay, so that's the book. There are more copies there. That's how you can find me. Um, I very much enjoy hearing from people I've spoken to. I also enjoy taking pictures of them, so I'm going to do that once more. This is just such a beautiful location. I hung it over it. Aaron, All right. Uh, maybe we have only because we had the problems before, yes. so, and then you have to go to, because everybody wants to see your books. Maybe we can take just two, a couple of questions, if okay. there are. And I have one question. In this new scenario, it's really inspirational what you say until now. For us also as consumer organization, eh? we see things changing, the digital and sharing economy. You know, this, this festival is fully based on the concept of sharing economy. So in this uh, framework where you see that uh, we have to approach uh, public working with private, uh, which is in, in your uh, way of thinking the role of consumer organization in this new scenario? Okay. Well, see, I think that consumer organizations are going to be one of the third parties that play an important role in regulating. <clears throat> you know, if you think about a consumer organization, you are representing the voice of the consumer, right? And so when creating the new regulatory framework, you are the seat at the table that is looking out for the consumer. And you often think that the government is playing that role, but as we all know, often, like, you know, the government's role is, like, you know, there, there, there may be situations where they are protecting vested interests or where they may not be as in touch with the consumer. And so another form of regulation that I advocate a lot is self-regulatory organizations. This is delegation of regulation to parties other than the government. And so it's not no regulation, it's just regulating by parties other than the government. And I've seen, for example, many buildings around the world, the people who live in the buildings have come together and said, let us have a policy about Airbnb. We are going to be friendly to Airbnb, or we are going to prevent Airbnb. 
And these are two separate choices. Some buildings might say, let's be friendly, because it'll raise property values. Others will say, no, we want to preserve the. But this is, you can think of it as a tiny consumer organization, which is actually the right organization to do the regulation, right? Because the people who suffer from the policy are the people in the building. And so at a larger scale, I think a consumer organization like yours um, is an important player in the regulatory framework and should take on an actual regulatory role in addition to being an advocate for the consumers. Thank you very much. So a very big challenge for us also in the next future in the sharing economy, if I understand so. Yeah. And I have many other questions, but I, we cannot put to, uh, okay. today now. May I can take just two questions very quick because okay. we have uh, uh, a show and then we, we can move to the okay. book. Uh, so call. why don't we take three questions in succession and then I'll answer all okay. of them together. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So my question, a very simple one. You said people are going more and more to work for themselves, so not to go anymore to work for companies. What is the biggest risk you think for companies and how they can prepare to improve and not to be so much affected of this effect? Okay. Right. Very, very simple. May uh, we have uh, the, the slide? <laughs> very, very simple question. Which one? Oh, all, all of them. Oh, uh, okay. okay. Can I share my? I yeah. will put them on slide share and uh, send around a link. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right. Maybe we can take two more questions, given that that was such a simple one. You know? yeah, my question is, uh, if you can explain us uh, which are the secret of the platform of um, BlaBlaCar, who create this trust, which is uh, so higher compared okay. to the others. All right. Um, I think my question is uh, kind of similar, and uh, as you say, the main, uh, they say that this kind of economy is based on trust. So how this kind of economy can build trust? Okay. All right. So um, <clears throat> two questions that I'll, I'll sort of answer them together. Um, but let's start with the question on what should companies do as like the model of work migrates away from full-time employment and towards self-employment. Well, there are two things that a smart company would do. Um, many companies are working on trying to understand how can I integrate on-demand talent into the operations of my company. And so if I have a workflow with like 10 steps, which of these steps needs someone there full-time? and which of these steps can actually be done through an on-demand source. So for content development, for web content development, for example, is one where there is also, there's already an active on-demand component. Sales is another, legal services is another. So thinking about how do I change, how do I evaluate each of the steps in each of my processes and replace full-time with on-demand and train my managers in a way that they think okay. about organizing work not just as on, you know, done by employees, but done through a mix of employment and on demand. But the bigger question for a lot of companies is, as the world moves towards crowd-based capitalism, does my business actually have a market anymore? Right, and you know, if you think about it, the, so the automobile companies, I don't tell them to think about on-demand labor. I tell them to worry about the fact that in 10 years, um, they may not have a business model at all because the number of autonomous cars is going to go up, the cars that drive themselves. What we trust about, like it used to be, right, that um, you, know, you, you bought a car because it was a statement about yourself. Like, I drive a Maserati, I drive a um, Lexus, I drive, today I drive a Prius, you know, that, but a lot of people don't care so much about that statement anymore. You care about this, right? I mean, you're making your statement based on the phone that you have, Snapchat, social media. 
And so meanwhile, platforms like Uber and Google and Lyft and Apple are way ahead in creating a platform through which we will call cars. And these cars will soon be autonomous. Like, you know, so if you look 20 years down the road, I worry about the business models of companies like GM and Ford and you know, BMW, Daimler, Fiat. And so that's a more fundamental question that many companies need to ask themselves. You know, as crowd-based capitalism starts to take over my industry, do I have a business model at all? Um, on the question of trust, um, so what exactly has Blablaka done to create trust? Um, you know, that's a question better asked to Blablaka. Um, what I think they have done is that they've recognized that um, there is, and this is something that, let me go back to one of these uh, slides here, yeah. That the things that make people feel comfortable with other people, and this is to your question as well about how do you create trust. Um, first of all, that it's not one facet or one feature that is going to generate enough trust. You know, this was okay for eBay. eBay said, online feedback, reputation, that's enough. Because you're getting a package from someone, the stakes are low. You know, but Airbnb and blah, blah, car are dealing with high stakes interactions, right? I'm letting a stranger into my spare bedroom. I'm driving to another city with a stranger. And so having, like, you know, some, you know, the recognition that this is a multifaceted sort of like creating trust online involves multiple cues, multiple factors that you have to give someone. And so you typically give someone peer feedback. You give them the ability to learn from the experiences of others. You give them social capital. Like this is, you know, you connect to Facebook or LinkedIn. Um, Facebook and LinkedIn are not digital networks, right? They are our real world social capital, our real world networks that have been digitized and brought online. So if I know someone, I have three friends in common with someone on Facebook, I'm more likely to trust them. Um, there are digitized versions of existing sort of like, you know, physical world trust systems. So identity can be established by holding up your driver's license to a camera, and then it gets sort of verified. And so there are many different things that constitute this. And one of the lessons that I've learned is that it's important to have all of them. Okay, a second lesson that I've learned is that different people, different consumers, will value different dimensions of this trust infrastructure differently. So some people care about identity. Some people trust other people who are blood donors. I don't know why. But there are people who are blood donors who say, if this person's a blood donor, I trust them. There are some people who trust if there's a passport. There are some people who trust if there's a mobile phone and a photograph. So the second thing to recognize is that what causes us to trust other people is different for different people. And you have to be sensitive across your customers to what each of them is tracking and to emphasize the features that seem to matter to a particular individual. And the third lesson I've learned is that when someone first starts using peer-to-peer -peer services, they are unfamiliar with what this digital trust stuff is. And at that point, the brand of the platform matters more. And so it's very hard to create a trusted platform without first having some brand power. And so when I look at what Blablacar users are doing, or what Airbnb users are doing, you find that initially what they care about a lot is the brand of the platform. And then as they become experienced users, they start to rely on the brand of the provider. The brand, you know, the brand of the driver might be a good reputation score. It might be you know, sort of a lot of these different trust things. It's like the individual's micro brand. That starts to matter sort of down the road. So thinking about these three facets, multidimensional trust, different trust cues for different consumers, and brand of the platform leading to brand of the individual. These are three lessons that I've taken away from my studies of trust. OK? Thank you very much. All right. I, Thank you, guys. Um, I think, I think we, we would love to, to listen to you for other hours. Yeah. Uh, well. 
uh, Arun will be uh, at disposal for, for the book uh, yes. um, uh, signing. I'll be there until and my hand in that falls corner. Off. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Thank okay, you. Very, thank it was you. very inspirational for thank us. You. It was a, a pleasure, really. Thank you. Uh, vi chiedo di rimanere perché non è finita la giornata. C'è uno spettacolo Homo Condomini Lupus che eh, ci porterà sui temi del, ancora della sharing economy e che spero eh, che possiate apprezzare. Chiedo scusa anche a chi ci offrirà questo spettacolo, ma abbiamo avuto degli inconvenienti eh, precedentemente e, e, e quindi abbiamo, siamo stati un po' lunghi sui tempi. Eh, adesso eh, rimetteremo a posto il palco, però vi chiedo di rimanere per vedere questo eh, bel pezzo anche ulteriore che chiude la giornata.